Hi everyone, uh, welcome to another video on criminological theories. Today we're going to be talking about control theories and uh, uh, the two major theoretical perspectives that exist within criminology associated with control, social control, social bonding, and, and the self-control theory. So today the major topics we're going to talk about is just control theories in general, kind of explain what they are. Uh, get into uh, Travis Hershey's 1969 uh, social control theory, also referred to as social bond theory or bonding theory, and uh, Godfordson's and Hershey's self-control theory, or the theory of low self-control. And uh, within that, I'm just going to talk briefly about the Grassmick scale, what's often referred to as the Grassmick scale, which helps uh, assess and, and measure uh, the notion of low self-control within individuals. So let's get going. Um, control theory. So in previous videos talked about learning theories and deterrence and, and anime theory, Merton theories and all this type of things. What those theories really essentially try to do is look at what makes people commit crime. So what factors influence an individual to commit crime? Control theories kind of flip it on its head and flip it around and say what makes individuals not commit crime. So Essentially, you ask why people refrain, refrain from violating the law even though they're presented with opportunities to commit crime. So everybody has the opportunity to commit crime on any given day, right? Just walking down the street, uh, maybe you could steal a bike, right? Or uh, break into a car, or steal something out of a mailbox, or whatever, right? Everybody has that opportunity within their life. You go to the store, you could take something off the shelves and not pay for it. But... Um, Control theorists recognize that and essentially are attempting to assess what stops the majority of people from doing that. So why do people do that? So that's what control theories are really essentially are trying to find factors that keep an individual from becoming deviant or delinquent or criminal. So what exists out there? So essentially within criminology, uh, one of the major theoretical perspectives in the initial control theories comes from Travis Hershey's. A 1969 uh, social control theory. As I noted earlier, that it's also referred to as social bond theory or even bonding theory. Um, and really what this theory it has some assumption. It assumes that an individual's behavior is controlled by connections a person has to a conventional social order. So essentially that everybody has these connections, right, to society to some degree, right, to your parents, to your family, to your friends, to your job, to your school, all these things, right, that uh, you're connected to, perhaps, right? And um, really what the main assumption is that delinquency is likely to occur or increase, increasingly likely to occur when an individual's bond to society is weakened or broken. So when a bond becomes weakened to your parents uh, early on in life or to your peers or to your school or to your job, then that allows for the like likelihood of deviance or delinquent or criminal acts to occur because there's no uh, that that connection isn't necessarily there anymore and that's prohibiting individuals to uh, conform to the social uh, social norm or social order and ideal social behavior so within uh, Hershey's social control theory there's four main concepts and I I, I put ABC here I here so it's kind of a, a memorization tool so if you remember that the four main concepts social control theory or social bonding theory a b c i attachment belief commitment involvement these are four domains right the four domains where bonds exist according to Hershey's early work and, uh, and uh, they help influence normative or pro-social or idealized behavior right and non-delinquent behavior and we'll talk about these each independently in a second so Attachment. So this can be referred to as attachment to others, essentially. It's uh, bonds established in clo close relationships to conventional others lacked as a deterrent to crime. People consider relationships and refrain from committing crime. So essentially, all the relationships and bonds that you have with your family, with your parents, your grandparents, your brothers and sisters, you know, you think about them instead of going and robbing a bank. You know, think about my grandma, right? Or going out there and selling heroin or something, all right? And what would your parents say? What would your grandma say about that? Those types of things. So, uh, or even your friends or uh, the people you work with or the school you go to, right? And we're talking about youth and delinquency and those types of things. So um, those are attachments, right? And 
according to the main assumption, so once those attachments become weakened or broken, uh, then that allows for delinquency to occur because people don't necessarily have the uh, motivation, the underlying motivation to uh, continue conformative behavior, essentially. So the three areas within attachment that uh, the theory looks at, social control theory looks at, according to Hershey, is the attachment to parents, so kind of talked about that, and that occurs early on in life, right? And you're around your parents for the first five, six years of your life pretty much exclusively, you know, and they're friends. You don't necessarily have friends, maybe if you're at a daycare or something like that. But that, that attachment in and of itself. So um, if it's ideal, if it's, you know, coming from a good situation, good com context, good climate, and all these factors, uh, that will help influence uh, uh, an idealized bond, a normative bond, a conventional bond to society. Uh, attachment to peers, this talks about your friends, right? You don't want to let your friends down, you want to show up for them. Uh, we've talked a lot about delinquent peers, especially within social learning theory. It is kind of conflictual here within social control theory, but they address this as well, right? Uh, and control theorists address this as well because there is a realization that delinquent friends, delinquent peers, uh, have a high influence on the individuals likely to be delinquent themselves. So look more into the theory. I'm not going to get too much in depth. I can do videos on this uh, alone from a control perspective. But essentially attachment to peers, we got friends at school, you know, or doing the right thing. And think back to elementary and, and high school and, and junior high, you know, and you're, and you're on these sports teams or with the band or whatever, uh, you know, these normalized peers that provide a good influence. You want to show up and do the right thing and be, you got attachment to them to some degree and you don't want to disappoint them letting them down by going out there and doing heroin, right? Or stealing cars or something like that. So attachment to school is, is the third domain. And all three of these have been isolated and examined, right? Through empirical research over the past, what, 50 years, uh, essentially, and a uh, you know, wealth of research has been directed towards the control theory. It's one of the most widely tested and validated theories within criminal justice and criminology. But attachment to school is the same notion, right? People have an attachment to their school, and they want, you know, school spirit and all these types of things, and their teachers and, and offer all these, you don't want to let your teachers down as a youth and all this type of stuff. So <clears throat> the next domain we're going to talk about um, is commitment. So commitment uh, is to conventional lines of action. So um, it's a desire to achieve conventional goals. So if you're committed, well, it will reduce the delinquency because make, it will make achieving those goals more difficult, right? Uh, there's no that you, you know, you can't, uh, if you want to be a police officer, you want to be a lawyer, you want to be a doctor, right? You're not going to go out there and rob a bank or selling drugs on the corner over there. Right? or getting in gang fights and all these types of things because you know, getting a felony on your record is really going to reduce the chances that you could become a lawyer or become a doctor or become successful within that domain. Right, So you have these goals, you know, be a fireman, be a biologist or whatever it is that a, a kid wants to be growing up. Right? This commitment to these conventional, conventional lines, conventional jobs, normative, pro-social, idealized, you know, uh, things that agree upon in society are relevant and legitimate goals to achieve, right? Um, so uh, that commitment to it, you know, uh, is going to reduce the likelihood, is theorized to reduce the likelihood of delinquent or criminal activity. And there's three illustrate three areas to illustrate that con uh, concept, right? The concept of commitment, education, right? And you want to in high school, um, mo hopefully, uh, you know, the youth. Most youth or children or adolescents within high school or in middle school or elementary school these days, I think they're worried about what college they'll get into, right? It's a big deal, right? Get into a good college so I can get the job that I want. Even when you're in college, I want to get a good good GPA so maybe I can get into law school or maybe I can get into the, a doctoral program or maybe I can get my master's in business administration or whatever, right? There's educational commitment. Right, so I'm not going to be out there uh, selling cocaine so I can get into law school, right? So that will probably hinder the ability to do so. You know, 
some youth don't realize that. I understand that and I appreciate that. But the majority of individuals realize that, make that recognition, real, uh, you know, realization. Now, occupational commitment. If you're you got a good job, you want to keep your job. So I'm not going to go out there and rob a bank, or get caught up in a felony, or in all these other types of things that exist in a bar fight or whatever. Because I don't want to lose my job. I want to get promoted, get the management position, get the big bucks, and all these types of things. So, uh, And the third domain is uh, passage to adult status. So and within the theory, it accounts for some youth that have to gain adult, gain adult status essentially earlier than others, right? If you have a kid when you're 18 or 17 or even 16, right? That's kind of a passage to an adult status. And that kind of deters you from committing crime because you have a commitment, right? You have a a baby you have to take care of. You can't be out there at 2 in the morning at the bar, at the club, or whatever. You know, some people will be, but in general, that's not going to be the case, right? Because that passage exists. Or getting a good job, you know, coming out of high school. You don't want to mess that stuff up, right? Um, and all these different things that exist. So, or married, perhaps, is another passage to an adult status. Um, so the next uh, area, next concept within social control theory is involvement. So it's involvement in conventional activities. So, so essentially it's a time dimension of commitment, what we just talked about, commitment. So if you're involved in these activities, these after-school activities, right, doing your homework so you'll be successful, well, how much time you're spending within that or in these after-school clubs or even volunteering, right, volunteering at the old folks' home or volunteering at the homeless shelter or whatever. That involvement, once you're doing that time, it's a, it's a time dimension of commitment. But the amount of time you invest there, um, you're directing your efforts towards these, your conventional goals, as opposed to you don't, and once you're doing that, you don't have time essentially to direct it towards selling cocaine on the side, uh, on the corner out there, or robbing banks and all these other types of things. So it's kind of difficult uh, concept to measure apart from commitment, but it exists. So uh, that's, that's the third one we're talking about. And the final concept we'll talk about with bonding theory or control theory, social control theory, is belief. It's essentially a belief of laws or rules that govern society here. Our belief systems pertaining to laws and rules. Um, in the absence of those beliefs uh, that forbid or discourage delinquency allows for such behavior to occur. So if people don't necessarily agree with or believe in the rules of society or follow the laws or believe in, within the laws, well, that opens the door, the likelihood, the chances, it increases the chances for delinquency or criminal activity to occur, right? So those are really the four main concepts, A, B, C, I, attachment, belief, commitment, and involvement associated with Hershey's social control theory in 1969. And like I said before, it's one of the most widely tested criminological theories, and it's, very, it's highly relevant theory to this day, and, and it's been developed consistently over the last 50 years. Um, within that, what makes uh, Travis Hershey interesting is that he actually, uh, with one of his... Uh, Students at Godfordson uh, in 1990 wrote a book, A General Theory of Crime. Uh, and so it's really, uh, it's his second theoretical perspective. And most theorists uh, just develop one big theory uh, within criminology and just milk that thing to the end of the day. So, uh, but uh, Travis Hershey is kind of unique that he's associated with uh, self control theory or the theory of low self control or low self control theory. Um, you know, uh, it's it's unique. It's a control theory as well, but it, it really isolates the idea of self-control. It just looks at one concept. So within uh, the social control theory, there's the four concepts, attachment, belief, commitment, and involvement. Self-control theory or theory of low self-control or low self-control theory looks at just self-control in and of itself. Uh, you should read their book. It's, it's, it's interesting and, and it's a good take on everything and it talks about self-control. So what is self-control? It accounts for a difference in the extent to which people are vulnerable to temptations, right? It provides a barrier between the momentary benefits of crime. So people with self-control are theorized to uh, be able to control themselves when the opportunity is present to not commit delinquent or criminal acts, right? So that's someone with high levels of self-control. They're able to forego, forego the immediate benefit that occurs from stealing a soda or robbing a bank or doing drugs or selling drugs. And that immediate 
or thrill that is achieved because you have self-control and that's really what Godfrey and Hershey were looking at. Uh, with that, with on the uh, opposite end of the spectrum is people with low self-control. People with lower levels of self-control are associated with more delinquent and criminal activities, right? Uh, low self-control, uh, people with low self-control uh, tend to be more impulsive, be more self-centered, be short-sighted, thrill-seeking, involved in risk-taking behaviors, don't consider the long-term effects of their or consequences of their actions. So it's the more immediate pleasure that is that is achieved through an act, and therefore uh, they can't constrain themselves, right? You see a Ferrari and the keys are in ignition, I'm jumping in it and I'm stealing that thing, right? Or a Mustang or anything, right? That's low self-control in a nutshell. They're very impulsive, uh, self-centered, not thinking about the individuals who've, whose Mustang that is, thrill-seeking, hey, I've never driven the big V8 with the supercharger on it, uh, and, and get involved in these risk-taking behaviors. Don't consider long-term consequences of their actions. So really, that's what they talk about. They talk about it at length. Uh, they talk about self-control at length. Um, and they really have, there's some big points that really stand out within the text and within this theory. So, uh, Self-control is theorized to establish early in life, so around 8 to 10 years of age essentially is settings, right? And so if you don't have your self-control developed by your teenage years, you're never going to get it, essentially. So it's, it's, and it's theorized to be constant over time. And that opens the door to some criticism uh, because there's an age crime curve. We'll talk about it in another video, uh, in the life course video. So look that up. And, and uh, there's an age crime curve that exists in adolescent limited and life course persistent offenders and these types of things. So that's a very unique criticism too. But they address that within the self-control theory to some degree as well. How adequate? That's open to uh, interpretation, right? So the results of, so essentially what uh, self-control is is the result of effective child rearing practices effective child rearing practices and that's how one establishes self-control and it's really uh, points a finger at the parents right and, and, and essentially like really if you don't have uh, teach your kids by the age of eight how to have self-control because what is parenting right is suppressing the impulsive behavior of kids and making them responsible for the actions if you don't teach that Early on in life, when you know the brain's developing, the body's developing, everything's developing at such a rapid pace in those early initial five, six, seven, eight years, you know that rapid development that's going on cognitively and physically and all these types of things, uh, um, then that's that's going to reduce the ability for an individual to have self-control. So essentially, what it really relies on is effective child rearing practices, um, and, and that's how it boils down in a nutshell to establish good levels of self self control uh, and, and the argument is that parents with low self control might be ineffective at instilling high levels of self control within their parents so it can be this ever in cycle and all these types of things so there's lots of research on that uh, go ahead and look at that I'm not trying to criticize anybody in parenting and all these types of things but it's essentially what the theory looks at is parenting stuff Right, and you need to teach your kids by the age of eight, ten. If you don't have these fundamental principles here, to control behaviors and make them responsible for their actions and other types of factors involved with parenting, idealized parenting skills, um, then you might have a problem. That individual might have a problem going through their life course essentially that they won't be able to get away from it. All right. Um, so self-control theory in and of itself. Uh, it's kind of difficult to measure because you're looking at self-control and how do we tell if somebody has low self-control? Well, they committed a lot of crime. Well, if they committed a lot of crime, then they have low self-control. It's kind of tautological to some degree. But within that, I bring this to the forefront. Is Grasmick and his colleagues in 1993 developed a scale, and it's referred to as the Grasmick scale, the Grasmick scale of low self-control. Google it, search it. Um, they really tell you one how to assess low self-control uh, and through questionnaires and they all low there's quantitative evidence to suggest that it's a very effective scale at measuring low self-control because these domains interact and load highly together so essentially there's six domains assessed so impulsivity 
really uh, asking questions about if, if an individual it, you know does things on a whim if they're impulsive with their behaviors and all these types of things simple task uh, if they don't have the concentration to be able to commit simple tasks uh, complete simple tasks they have to get bored and all these types of things risk-seeking behaviors uh, questions asking about whether or not they want to go out and thrill-seeking types of activities right uh, physical activities it's questions asking if if you spend time thinking as opposed to going out and and doing uh, rather be out there doing something and more physical and all this type of stuff self-centered do you care about yourself more than others and you only think about yourself your needs supersede other people's and temper that really is do you get angry easily and all these types of questions so that's really what the grasping scale taps into these domains and, and really it's an assessment a quantitative way to assess a way to assess through a survey with numbers um, how to measure low self-control of individuals to see if this actually these factors are responsible for crime in and of itself and the the scale has been validated numerous times and it, it seems to be a higher highly reliable measure and it's something you should be aware of if you're trying to read into low self-control essentially how, how this this concept is measured and assessed because there are problems with the way things are assessed within all theories, all right? Um, but to recap everything, uh, talked essentially uh, really about these topics, what control theories are. Uh, control theories kind of look at the, the equation differently. Instead of saying, this is why individuals become delinquent, uh, it kind of flips it around and says, why do individuals um, do delinquent acts when everybody has the opportunity to do so. It's in Hershey's social control theory theorized uh, uh, delinquency is likely to occur when there's a weakened or, or broken bond, right? And it's an attachment, belief, commitment, involvement. These um, help normalize bonds to a conventional society. Godfrinson and Hershey's low self-control theory really isolate self-control. And they say self-control is the the result of uh, effective child rearing practices. All right, and once uh, that's diminished to some degree, and, and, and self control is set in by eight, you know, early on, eight, eight to ten years of age, uh, if an individual doesn't learn self control by then, well, they're probably going to have low self control throughout their life course, uh, and um, that is the prominent prominent factor associated and responsible for criminal activity and. Within that, the grasping scale talked just briefly about that, about how those self-control is measured. So this is the control theories in a nutshell, the two main control theories associated with, uh, well, within criminology um, and, and testing uh, why crime and deviant activities occur. And, uh, you know, look into these things a little bit more, do some Google searches, and you'll find a lot of good information that exists out there within them, right? Hopefully this, this video helps y'all, you know, see y'all on the next time.